book of Job. Job is, of course, the book is named after its main character, Job. And that name, Job, it's not attested elsewhere in, in Hebrew. But you do see a, a similar names, a name that's thought to be an equivalent to the Hebrew Job. It appears in the archives that have been discovered of other people groups with similar languages called Western Semitic languages. You find an equivalent of Job there from the archives of the second millennium BC, so from 2000 to 1000 BC, archives have been discovered. For example, the archives at Alalak in Turkey, the archives at Mari in Ugarit in northern Syria, and the archives at Ashtart in northern Jordan. And those, in those languages, those Western Semitic languages, you have this equivalent name that appears, and there the name seems to carry the meaning, where is the Father? With Father standing in for the name of a God. Now if that sense is carried over into the Hebrew, if the Hebrew includes that same sense that these other Western Semitic languages have of the equivalent name, well then, then the name Job could mean, where is Yahweh? And that would be interesting, right? I mean, where is Yahweh in the book of Job? But since the Old Testament, neither the Old Testament nor later rabbinic sources, neither of them attach any particular meaning to the name Job, it's probably safer or best not to speculate. Now, Job, he's identified as living in the land of Uz, which was outside of Israel, probably in the region to the south that later became known as Edom. And I say that because in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 21, it there uses Uz in parallel with Edom. So it looks like that's the same region, at least by the time of Lamentations. And a man named Uz is listed in a genealogy of the people of Edom. You see that in Genesis 36, 28 and 1 Chronicles 1, 42. So it looks like Uz is probably that area to the south that later became known as Edom. And Job is probably not an Israelite. Because even if he lived after the time of Abraham, which is by no means clear, he may have been before Abraham, but even if he lived after the time of Abraham, he lived in the land of Uz, outside of Israel, and he shows no awareness of God's covenant with Abraham and his descendants. Now, various clues in the book of Job indicate that the events of Job are from a very early time perhaps before the patriarchs, perhaps before the time of Abraham. These clues include how Job's wealth is measured. For example, it's in livestock and servants rather than in land and precious metals like gold and silver, which you tend to see later as a measure of wealth. His lifespan of more than 140 years goes back and suggests an earlier time. His essentially acting as a priest for his family looks like something from an earlier time. And the presence of these roving bands of Sabaeans and Chaldeans, all of that looks like you have, it's a, from a very early time, perhaps before the time of the patriarchs. But the date of the events of the book, that's different than the time the book was composed. It's like if I'm writing something now and I'm writing something about the Civil War, Okay, the events are back from then, but when I'm writing it is a different story. And in terms of the composition of the book, we have very little to go on about when was the book actually composed. The human author or the creator of the book is nowhere identified, and neither is the time of the composition of the book. Now, since the prophet Ezekiel and his audience they seem to be aware, they're familiar with Job. You see that in Ezekiel 14, verse 14 and verse 20. Ezekiel and his audience are familiar with Job. We know that the work of Job in at least some form was known by the 6th century B.C. Now, how much earlier 
and in what form it was known prior to that, at that time, it's unclear. Because the book of Job could have been put together over a period of time. You see, it, it, it's not necessarily something that's just written in one sitting. But we know that Ezekiel's aware of Job by the 6th century. So at least we have something of Job predating that. Now, some have dated the book of Job to the time of Moses, all right, 15th century B.C. Others have dated it to the time of Solomon, the 10th century B.C. But most scholars today, they date the final form of the book of Job to the 7th or 2nd, between the 7th and 2nd centuries B.C. Okay, that's a mighty wide span, right? But we can't be sure because you just don't have sufficient data to be able to make a clear determination. But the good news is that the uncertainty about that doesn't really hinder our interpretation. Here's what Tremper Longman says about that in his commentary on Job and the Baker commentary on the Old Testament series. He says, in conclusion, it is admittedly impossible to prove that Job was an original authorial whole. In other words, that it was all done in one shot. It could have been done incrementally. You could have had compilers and this kind of thing. Nor is it possible to prove that it was written over an extended period of time. Neither point is important. What is crucial, at least for the church, which has received the final form of the book as canonical, as part of scripture, is to interpret the book as it presently stands. Okay, and that's the key, is that whatever the, however the book comes to be, the book is in our canon in a certain form. That is how it functions, and so we need to look at it that way. Now, Hebrew scholars, they all acknowledge the difficulty in translating the book of Job. It has many rare words in it, okay, which means then it's difficult to be sure of the meaning because if you only have a word showing up a couple of times, it's hard to get a clear bead from the context of what does the word mean and what are the limits of the meaning of that word. So it has a lot of rare words and it includes difficult grammar. So there's, there's more room than normal for disagreements about translation. And if you've compared translations of the book of Job, you'll see that. Whether you've looked at uh, standard English translations and compared them, or whether you've included in that translations from uh, scholarly commentators. Now what I did is I worked principally from the English Standard Version, but I consulted a, a good number of other translations when I was studying this, including the translations of scholarly commentators. I have a number of commentaries, so people who are uh, Hebrew scholars will provide their own translations and talk about the Hebrew, so I've consulted some of that. Now, when I opt in the course of teaching it for a less common translation, I'll usually point that out so you'll know. You say, well, that seems weird. My translation's saying this. I'll make a point of letting you know what I'm doing and why I'm understanding it a certain way. Now, it's helpful to keep in mind, I think, that Job is not a newspaper report. See, Job's not a newspaper report of ancient events. It's a literary work based on those events. So it's not like reading a newspaper there. It means that whoever was involved in the production of the completed work, the form of the book of Job that we have in Scripture, whether it was authors, editors, compilers, whoever had a hand in producing the book that we now have as Scripture, that person or those people, they were moved by the Spirit to express the story in this particular form to give the story this particular literary shape. And we need to respect the Spirit's choice in that regard and understand the revelation according to the form in which the Spirit gave it. When the Spirit gives us something in poetry, we need to respect that he chose to communicate it in poetry. He could have done it differently. But if he does it in poetry, then you and I need to be aware of that and respect the form in which the Spirit has given it to us. Now, the structure of Job is, for the most part, pretty straightforward. You have here in the first two chapters this prose prologue, in other words, non-poetry, in the prologue, where you have the int introduces the characters and the plot in chapters 1 and 2. And then chapter 3, 
we get Job's complaint. We then go into poetry at chapter 3, and we get Job's complaint. And then that then triggers these three cycles of dialogues or speeches. I say it that way because they're not really dialogues in that they don't really respond directly to one another, like politicians with talking points. They kind of talk past each other. But some, to some extent, there's dialogue. So I just call it dialogue or speeches. But they run through chapter 4 down through chapter 31. Now, there's a little question about how to understand 28 to 31. I'll say about, something about that in a second. So you first get the prose prologue that introduces the characters and the plot. And then you get Job's lament or his complaint. And that then really triggers these dialogues or speeches. And you have three cycles. You have the first cycle where it begins in chapter 4. And it goes, Eliphaz talks, Job talks, Bildad talks, Job talks, Zophar talks, Job talks. That's the one cycle. Then you go with the second cycle, beginning in chapter 15. Same thing. Eliphaz, Job. Bildad, Job. Zophar, Job. Then we get to the third cycle. And there you have, starting in chapter 22, now you just you have Eliphaz, Job. Bildad, Job. No Zophar. Zophar's not there. He doesn't, he doesn't appear again. And then instead, and by the way here, when I have 26 to 31... When I say the structure of the book's uh, pretty straightforward, a lot of people would take chapters 28 to 31 and break that out as a separate monologue of Job's. In other words, not include it as part of the third cycle. They would just go Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, 26 and 27, and then 28 to 31 say this is Job's monologue that is not really part of that cycle. Looks to me like it's all part of the same thing, so that's why I grouped 26 to 31. But here you don't have, you don't have Zophar appear, and instead you get this young man who's heretofore uh, unidentified who breaks in. This is Elihu. And then you have Elihu's monologue in, in 32 to 37. No response to Elihu. And is Job going to say anything? No. What happens is Yahweh, God, breaks in in the whirlwind. And this is when we see in 38 through 41, he speaks. And then in 42, 1 to 6, you see Job repents. And then we have the prose epilogue. So we have a prose prologue, prose epilogue. And in that epilogue, that's Job's restoration. And you're all familiar, I, I know, with the, with the basic story and how that, how that unfolds. Now, in the dialogue section, you will, if you don't know already, you will see that the claims and arguments that are made by Job's friends and by Job, they're repeated frequently and in various forms, almost to the point of tedium. You just get different presentations of some very similar claims and arguments. But I think that, that near tedium is by design. It serves to reinforce the book's message about the limitations of human wisdom. You see, that's part of the design of the book, I think. It illustrates how human wisdom can pursue and continue groping, almost like chasing its tail. It can continue doing this with no advance. So we just have these things repeated and repeated and a response and response and repeated and there's no real advance. And I think that's saying something about the limitations of human wisdom. Some things, like the mystery of human suffering, are hidden in God. And they can only be grasped if he chooses to reveal specially, not just generally, specially, its purpose and its meaning. Now, in what I'm going to be presenting to you, my understanding of the book of Job, I was most helped by the commentary by Tremper Longman that I already mentioned, but I consulted a number of other commentaries in studying it, including the three-volume commentary by David Kleins and the commentaries by John Hartley, Elmer Smick, Samuel Ballantyne, and Norman Habel. Now, all of that's kind of mixed in as I go through because I... Uh, you know, disagree here in some places, and I just, I, I give you what I think is the best understanding. 
But as you can see, there's a lot of room for skin and the cat differently on some of these things. And I'll just explain it to you how I understand it. Now, because of the length of Job, normally when I'm teaching text, I like to basically go through line by line or paragraph by paragraph and deal with everything. Job is lengthy, so what I'm going to do, often I'm going to summarize a number of lines or paragraphs. I'll frequently put the text up so you can see if you think I'm crazy in what I'm telling you. But I won't be as detailed on some of the things just for the sake of time. All right, in chapters 1 and 2, let's start looking at the text. In chapters 1 and 2, we get the prologue here. And Job is introduced, he's introduced as the epitome of a godly wise man. That's who Job is. He's described as blameless and upright. Some translations will say innocent and virtuous. One who fears God and turns away from evil. He's described that way by the composer or the author of the book of Job. And that description is twice affirmed by God himself. You see in chapter 1, 8 and chapter 2, verse 3. God says, yes, that's who Job is. He's blameless and upright and he fears God and turns away from evil. Now that picture of Job, that picture is reinforced by the report that Job regularly would offer burnt offerings for his children after their various birthday parties. And he would do that just in case they may have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. See, just internally, having these sense of rebellion or rejection of God, not vocalizing, but just in case he'd done that. Now, whether that kind of sacrifice would have any effect Apart from the repentance and the participation of the sinner, that's not the point. That's not why it's mentioned to Job. The point is that Job is so religiously devout. He's so devout that he was concerned about his children's possible sin. And he offered sacrifices in the hope of gaining God's mercy on their behalf. This is the kind of person we're talking about. Okay, here's somebody who's this way. Longman points out in his commentary, he says in Proverbs, these terms that are used to describe Job, whether it's blameless or innocent and upright or virtuous, those terms refer to people who do what is morally correct. You see, do I have Longman's thing in here? No, I don't have Longman, so let me just read it to you. Okay, so you have in Proverbs, these terms refer to people who do what is morally correct. They're the ones who heed the commands of the Father and gain wisdom. Their lives are largely marked by ethical rightness and legal obedience. Okay, so from these descriptions that you get of Job and from God's affirmation of Job's character, what we as the readers know for a fact, we know absolutely for a fact that Job is pious and devout. He is a pious and devout servant of God. He's not sinless. No mere human is sinless. He's not sinless, but Job is a paragon of faithfulness. We know that. We are told that. That's not up for debate. Now, there's a clear stream of teaching in the Old Testament. This is crucial. For understanding what's going on. We don't know when Job is composed. We know that it's referring to events very early. But there's a clear stream of teaching in the Old Testament that connects rewards and blessings with the righteous living that flows from godly wisdom. So you've got righteous living, godly wisdom that flows from that rewards and blessings. There's this stream in the Old Testament that connects those. And it connects suffering and punishment with the wickedness that flows from folly, that flows from a rejection of divine wisdom. Certain sections of Proverbs, for example, support that understanding. Well, there's the, uh, there's the quote by Longman I was looking for. But certain sections of Proverbs, this understanding where you have blessings tied to righteous living, 
punishment and suffering tied to wickedness. You can see this. This is a stream of the Old Testament. For example, Proverbs 12, 20, no ill befalls the righteous, but the wicked are filled with trouble. 13, 21, disaster pursues sinners, but the righteous are rewarded with good. And you see that there. You see it in the promises of blessings and curses that are in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. And you see it in the judgments that, that were brought on Israel and Judah as those judgments are explained in Samuel and in Chronicles and by the prophets. You see this clear stream that says blessings, good things tied to righteous living that flows from wisdom. Suffering and punishment tied to the wickedness that flows from a lack of wisdom and a rejection of God. Now the abundant blessings of righteous Job fit very comfortably within that theology, right? I mean, that's what we expect. Job is a paragon of faithfulness. He's declared to be innocent, blameless, upright, fears God, does all of these things. God affirms that. We know that's the kind of person he is. So it doesn't surprise us in the least to see that Job has all kinds of good stuff. Right? Job has all kinds of good things. His cup overflows with sons and daughters, bountiful livestock, very many servants. So many that Job is described as the greatest of all the people of the East. Well, that fits. Look at the guy he is. He's pious righteous, devout. Okay, that's how it rolls. That's how God rolls. When you're that way, you have all of these things, you see, that come to you. His great blessings, they're fully expected. Fully expected within a theology that absolutely or mechanically links piety and blessing, righteousness and abundance. It's perfectly expected. That's what would happen. But the story takes a challenging turn. You see, it takes a challenging turn as the scene shifts to the heavenly realm. There we have angelic beings. They're presenting themselves before God Almighty and the Satan. Now, it's literally, it's the adversary. And there are people who deny that this adversary is, in fact, the being that we know as Satan. But Satan is the ultimate adversary. So I say Satan. You see, he is the adversary. So you have these angelic beings who are presenting themselves, and this ultimate adversary, Satan, is at that time he's still permitted to come among them and to have some kind of access to God. And so they're there, and here Satan is there. And Satan says to God that he's been prowling the earth. And he's been doing that, no doubt, seeking to expose as hypocrites. Seeking to expose as hypocrites all of God's ostensibly faithful servants. Those who might appear to the heavenly court to be human, humans living true lives of devotion to God. Lives of true devotion. You see, they might seem that way, but he's been prowling around looking to expose them. These people who have a good cover. And that's why God recommends Job. He recommends Job for Satan's consideration. It is because Satan has been prowling around, looking here, you know, seeking to expose as hypocrites all of these people who might appear to be truly pious and truly devout. They're all phonies. There are no such people like that. And so that's why God, given that what Satan is doing, that's why God recommends to Satan Job. He identifies Job to Satan as the real deal. He's the real deal. He's the supreme example of a truly pious, God-fearing human being. In other words, unbeknownst to Job, Job has no idea of this. 
Unbeknownst to Job, he is chosen by God. He's chosen by God to be the standard bearer of human commitment and devotion to God. To be mankind's champion. Mankind's champion against the claim that all humans are at bottom pretenders who ultimately serve only themselves. That's the charge that's made. And Job doesn't know that he's been chosen by God to be the counterexample, to be mankind's champion of true piety and devotion. You see, that's why Satan, that's why he responds to God's recommendation of Job with the accusation that Job serves God only from self-interest. He serves God only because God pays him to do so by granting him wealth and blessings in return. He says, listen, you don't really know what's going on. You're just paying the guy. He's a spiritual prostitute. He's only devout and devoted. He's doing this stuff simply because you pay him. That's all it is. It's ultimately self-interest. He doesn't care a thing about you. None of these people care a thing about you. And so that's what Satan, that's why he goes through that. And he proposes to prove that God's confidence in Job and thus God's confidence in any human being, his confidence in mankind is misplaced. He, he wants to prove to God that, this, that his confidence is misplaced by declaring that he says, look, here's a test. Job will curse you to your face, meaning he will abandon, openly abandon his commitment and devotion to you. He will openly terminate your relationship. He will just say adios. He will openly do that if you'll take away the things that he has. He'll do that. And so God expresses his confidence in Job by permitting Satan. Now, do you see what this is from God's side? What confidence he has. What an honor for Job that God expresses his confidence in Job by permitting Satan to take away all the things he has. Meaning his livestock, his servants, and his children, which Satan promptly proceeds to do through raids by the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans, by lightning, what's called fire of God from heaven, and through a great windstorm. Satan takes away from Job his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his cattle, his servants, and his children, all taken. All the things he has are taken away from Job. Satan pulls no punches. He takes promptly everything that God permitted him to take. You see, he says, you can take the things he has, all of them taken. Now, it's important for us to recognize that Satan is not God's equal. See, Christians are not Persian Zoroastrians, people who believe creation's locked in a battle between two opposing and roughly equal forces of good and evil, light and darkness, God and Satan, so that the ultimate outcome is somehow up for grabs and uncertain. That is not a Christian understanding of God and creation. In fact, it's heretical. God is sovereign. He is supreme. Satan is a creature. He's a creature, and as the text makes clear, he can only do what he's permitted by God to do. He's on a leash. It's not these two roughly equal powers battling it out. Not at all. He can only do what God permits him to do. And after Job's devastating losses, when you think about that, all of his possessions, his children, the very famous line we read in Job 1, 20 to 22, 
Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Now in chapter 2, there's essentially a repeat. That's why when I say there's these stylized prose prologue, it's stylized because you get basically a repeat of what you see in the opening heavenly scene. But this time God points out to Satan that Job holds fast his integrity. He points this out to him that Job continues to be devoted to God despite the extreme test that Satan had claimed would prove Job's faith was superficial and self-centered. So he lets Satan know, uh, strike one. You see, there. by the way, have you noticed that the guy you said would curse me to his face if I took away his things? Looks like you were wrong. So he mentions that. Now, in, in, as a footnote here, in, in verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3, where God says that, that he'd been moved to destroy Job for no good reason. Now, he's not saying there that Job, serving as the standard bearer of human commitment and devotion to God, that that's not a good reason. That's not what he's saying. He means the suffering he allowed to be inflicted was not based on any fault of Job's. In other words, it was not something that was punishment or discipline for some sin. You allowed, I did this, though he had done nothing that deserved it. That's what he means for no good reason. He's not saying that the reason for which he permitted it wasn't a good reason. And so you can easily get sidetracked there. All right, Satan then claims, Satan then claims that the test that, that, that he just went through, where he took all the things that he had, that that test wasn't extreme enough. He said, well, I just underestimated. The test that we just ran to expose that Job's a phony and a spiritual prostitute, he says that that test wasn't extreme enough in that it it affected only Job's external things. It didn't affect his own body and his health. Ooh. He says it it took away. Yes, yes, those those are serious things. But it didn't affect his body and his health. He says if God will strike Job's body and health, if he'll do that, if Job is made to suffer physically rather than just emotionally, if he's made to suffer physically, he said, then he'll disown you and he'll curse you to your face. So God again expresses his confidence in Job. By permitting Satan to strike his body and health, but he forbids him from taking his life. You can put him through the physical ringer, but you cannot kill him. And so God, but you see what confidence that is. What an honor that is. And Satan promptly strikes Job with painful sores or boils from head to foot. I mean, Job is in absolute physical misery. He's in complete misery. He's scraping the sores with broken pieces of pottery as he sits on the ash heap, which is a sign of mourning. I mean, the guy's just, he's just, you know, just killing him. And so you can just picture this. His situation is so bad. That his wife counsels him in chapter 2, verse 9, to curse God and die. See, from her perspective, suicide by God, renouncing God, and then presumably having God kill him, would be preferable to holding on to his commitment to God and continuing to suffer so terribly. Now you look at that and you say, if you've had loved ones suffer... You know, the temptation to say, man, I, this has to end. I want this to end. And so she says something that's not wise, but you can at least understand when you see somebody suffering like that, you know, the phrase, put him out of his misery. 
You see, so this is what she comes in and she, she makes this statement. And then Job tells his wife in verse 10 that she was speaking like one of the foolish women. Speaking like one of them. And then he asked rhetorically if they should receive good from God, if they should do that but not accept trouble or adversity that God allows in one's life. Should we take all the blessings and the benefits that God pours into us but not accept the adversity and the hardship that he brings. So despite even physical suffering, despite even physical suffering, Job didn't curse God. He did not renounce or abandon God, contrary to what Satan had claimed. He didn't do that. Rather, he stayed firmly in his relationship with God. That relationship was not dependent on the gifts received from God. And verse 10 ends with, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, with the clear indication in chapter 2, verses 7 to 10, that Job maintained his loyalty to God in the face of even physical suffering, the focus of the book, it then shifts. It shifts from Job's motivation for his relationship with God, whether he was loyal to God because he was paid well, it shifts from his motivation for that relationship to the question that is raised by the test of that motivation. It shifts to that question that's raised there. That is the question of human suffering. The question of human suffering. Now, the test of motivation. That test is still in the background. It's still in the background as Job's suffering drags on. It's understood by the reader to be the immediate cause of Job's suffering. But no further mention is made of Satan. Nothing else is said about Satan or his challenge. Job's steadfastness in the face of prolonged suffering. Prolonged physical suffering. His steadfastness in that, it's anticipated by his refusal to curse God in the face of the tremendous but relatively short emotional and physical suffering that he's undergone. You see, so his faithfulness in the prolonged physical suffering, it's anticipated but his prolonged physical suffering, that prolonged suffering produces some distinctive cracks. It produces some distinctive cracks and it drives Job to say things about God for which he later repents. You see, Job is sitting here, we, we always focus on the prologue and the epilogue. And we miss the entire part in the middle. Well, you're going to see, and I hope you can understand what it's like to suffer day after day, week after week, as suffering, physical suffering drags on. If there's not a person here who can understand and relate to these cracks that appear in Job, you see, uh, that's something. For example, Eliphaz, you see, the indicative of the cracks. Eliphaz says in Job 15.6, 15, your own mouth condemns you, and not I. Your own lips testify against you. 15, 12, and 13, he says, Why does your heart carry you away? Why do your eyes flash, you see, with anger? Why do your eyes flash that you turn your spirit against God and bring such words out of your mouth? And at the end, in chapter 42, verse 3, after God speaks in the whirlwind, Job acknowledges that he spoke... He spoke about things he, he didn't know. He spoke out of ignorance, things that were above his pay grade. And then he says in 42.6, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. The Old Testament scholar Elmer Smick, he says, what lifts the book to literary and theological greatness is the author's deaf presentation of a truly righteous man whose commitment to God is total, yet who can still struggle with God to the point of rage. 
over the mystery of God's ways. And you will see Job is being just put through the ringer. And you'll see these very human cracks of a very righteous man. Okay, but as I say, his faithfulness, his not cursing God throughout prolonged, it's anticipated, it's predicted, it's going to turn out to be true, but you and I are going to go on a journey through the vortex of his suffering and what it produces in him. And I hope that through that, you know, we'll see some things about God, and I hope in your own life that will be useful to you. But through it all, Job remains true. See, he remains true to his conviction about God, his commitment to him, put it that way. And it remains true that Job doesn't curse God. In all the emotional storms and the spiritual struggles and all those things that his prolonged physical suffering, he doesn't renounce or abandon God. He struggles greatly with God. He struggles greatly with him, caught between his pain and the inability to make sense of it. That's the vice that he's in. And so he struggles greatly with God. And in that emotional vortex, he denies God's commitment to his welfare. And he charges God with wrongdoing. He charges God with being unjust. But he never cuts off his relationship with God. He never curses God to his face and abandons God. So Satan's claim that Job would curse God, it remains disproved throughout the book. But it moves to the background, you see. That whole thing about his motivation and those things is in the background. Now, given Job's false charges against God that he will make in these speeches and this dialogue section... When God says in chapter 42, verse 7, that Job spoke of him what is right, he's not approving everything Job said. He's not doing that. Sometimes people look at that and then they think that baptizes everything Job said. And it doesn't. Because God has just finished rebuking Job for wrongly accusing him during his dispute with the friends. He's just finished rebuking him. Rather, God is saying, uh, well, if I'm alive next week, I'll carry on. <laughs> okay. Thanks for coming.